Good afternoon and welcome to Baptist Health International's monthly medical lecture. I would like to extend warm greetings to our returning friends across the Latin America and the Caribbean. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dr. Roelio Rivas, Corporate VP of Baptist Health International. This afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Roy Cardoso, hand and upper extremity orthopedic surgeon at Miami Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute, part of Baptist Health South Florida. His presentation will be on conditions of the hand. Dr. Roy Cardoso is an orthopedic surgeon specializing in conditions of the hand and upper extremity at Miami Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute, part of Baptist Health South Florida. He is board certified in orthopedic surgery with a subspecialty certificate in the surgery of the hand. Dr. Cardozo received his medical training at George Washington School of Medicine, Washington, DC. He completed a surgery internship at Tulane University Medical Center in New Orleans, Louisiana, where he also began his orthopedic surgery residency, which he then completed at UC Davis Medical Center, Sacramento, California. He then served at a, as hand and upper extremity fellowship at Wake Forest Medical Center, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Prior to joining Baptist Health, Dr. Cardozo was a hand and upper extremity surgeon at Orthopedic Associates USA. In addition, he was assistant professor of hand and upper extremity surgery at the University of Miami. Dr. Cardozo has lectured nationally and internationally on his areas of specialization, including brachial plexus, wrist, and elbow injuries. He has also participated in many volunteer medical trips overseas. He is involved in both clinical and basic science research and has co-authored several medical articles and book chapters. Dr. Cardoso is a member of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, American Society for Surgery of the Hand, American Association for Hand Surgery, and Miami Orthopedic Society. Dr. Cardoso is fluent in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. So please, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Roy Cardoso. Dr. Cardoso, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rivas. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you guys. Um, I uh, had thought of a number of topics that I um, had considered, um, and I tried to keep it as relevant as possible to, to all of your interests. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure some of you may have a specific interest in orthopedics or in hand surgery, but I, I suspect uh, that the vast majority of you um, will you know, not go into hand surgery or in orthopedics, but would see hand injuries in primary care or in the emergency room. Um, and I hope that the talks today um, can kind of help you sort of in your immediate future. Um, so the first talk we're gonna do is basically a discussion of examination of the thumb. Um, the thumb is sort of, uh, it's considered a finger by some, uh, I mean that sort of jokingly, uh, but not a finger by others. It's sort of uh, the opposite uh, of a finger. And so the examination can be kind of complicated because as human beings, we do so many things with our thumbs. Opposition is what makes us human. Uh, and so a lot of th things can go wrong with the thumb. So I think it's, a, it's an appropriate uh, topic to discuss. And then after that, I'm gonna go with you, over with you guys uh, just a couple of other quick topics um, related to hand and things that we do a little bit uh, differently at uh, the Sports Institute here in uh, here at Baptist Hospital. Um, so uh, without further ado, we're going to talk about the thumb. So here, on, uh, can everybody see my, can you see my screen, Dr. Rivas? Not yet, sir. Okay, let me see what I can do to uh, share that. Any better? It's starting. We're on. We're on. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to start with a test. I know you thought you were going to uh, just have a lecture, but we actually have an exam. Just, just kidding. So let's see. Get this going. So, what are the most important things that we need to do to arrive at a diagnosis? When you see a patient, how do we figure out what's going on with them? Is it the x-rays? Is it the exam? Is it the, is it the history? What, what do you guys think is the most important uh, way of figuring out a clinical diagnosis? This is true in orthopedics as, as it is in, in anything medical. Um, 
And I would argue with you that um, history is the most important thing. And, and really, I know it sounds, uh, it's corny and stereotypical, but it, it's, it's come through for me countless times. Listening to the patient and asking the right questions is the key to, to diagnosis. Um, you know, sometimes we'll see an x-ray and the patient will have terrible arthritis in their hand. And uh, it's assumed that that's why they're coming to see you. And if you start talking to them about arthritis and then find out that it's about something completely unrelated, it happens to me all the time. So again, you know, uh, just as your professors have always told you, um, history from the patient, really taking time to listen to them is, is paramount in, in orthopedics as it is throughout medicine. And then the exam and the images and everything else um, helps to back up what, what the history is telling you. Um, so, you know, basic history, when did it start? How, what did you notice? When did you notice it? What do you think makes it worse? What makes it better? Have you had it before other hand affected? Just like other parts of medicine, the who, what, where, when comes to play with hand surgery as well. Um, you know, a question that I often ask patients is, why do you think you have the condition? Um, it's amazing to me the answers that they tell me about why they think. They would they love to, to, to know that you are asking them why they think they have the problem, rather than assuming that you know um, the problem. And then, of course, you know, one of the reasons I love uh, hand surgery is that it's very functional. And so, you know, um, it affects patients' life. So obviously, getting to know what, what this condition is preventing them from doing is, is key. And then you wanna know, is it the worst pain in the world? Is it stopping them from doing their day-to-day -day activities or is it just a minor annoyance that their uh, husband or wife told them they need to come in for, but they would otherwise not really be interested in seeing you for. So you need to know what level is of dysfunction the injury is causing them. And so again, what do they think is going on? What is going on in their heads? Because that also um, gives you a sense of their level of anxiety. You know, you'll see a little bump on a hand and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, it's a little cyst, um, not a big deal, something that's easily taken care of when in the back of the patient's mind, this is something that they can't, that they've been losing sleep over because they think it's cancer. I had, a, I had patients who had breast cancer before and they have a little cyst on their hand and they don't know if this is a um, metastatic process or maybe they had a friend who, who died from cancer and, and they're worried about that. So it's, it's great to ask your patients what they think is going on so you get a sense of where their mindset is and so that you can educate them appropriately. Physical examination. Um, in orthopedics, the most important under, um, thing to understand when you're examining somebody is, is the anatomy. And the better anatomist you are, the better doctor you'll be, but certainly that's true in orthopedics and, and in hand surgery. So understanding anatomy is, is key. Uh, we're not gonna go through all of these things, um, but as you learn anatomy, look, looking for all of these hundreds and thousands of things that are important, are of course important, but there are a couple of uh, dirty little secrets in hand. So, when you guys do your orthopedic rotation or if you do your emergency rotation or even if you see a patient in the clinic or in the primary care clinic that has a hand issue that we're going to go through some some tips and tricks about how to get through those patients so you know all of us don't necessarily do a complete exam okay so two exams have never been done in the same order. So based on the history, we start where the problem is or where the money is, you know? Is it a joint problem? You will examine the joints first. And almost every patient that comes through has trigger finger and carpal tunnel syndrome, or they think they do. And so we test everybody for, for those problems. And a lot of people have what's called CMC arthritis. That's arthritis at the base of the thumb, especially in any, any patient who's older than 50 years old, um, tends to have some sort of CMC arthritis, even if it's not, even if it's not symptomatic uh, on a daily basis. Okay. And then here's the other thing is like every, every, it says every decade, but even every year that I've been in practice, 
I've been in practice about 11 years and I'm, I'm, I have, uh, I learn something new every day, um, which is one of the reasons I love what I do. Okay, so some pearls are in order. So, you know, we're gonna talk about a thumb exam. Um, and when you write your notes on your clinical, on your clinical rotations, or even when you're documenting in the medical record, um, accurately describing the motion of the thumb and what's key is to compare it to the other side. So somebody may have all humans, what makes us unique about humans is that we're all different, right? So comparing, you would consider compared to your thumb, a person may be very lax or may be very tight, but then you examine the other side and you realize that that's just them. That's just who they are. So comparing your findings to the other side are, are key. And try to be quantitative when possible. We document uh, ranges of motion with goniometers. Sometimes we use um, grip strength um, uh, meters to, to document that as well. And again, I can't emphasize enough that your understanding of anatomy is key. So we're gonna just talk about motion. Um, you talk about thumb opposition. So um, unfortunately, uh, we're not live, so I can't quiz you guys individually. Um, but you know, this is a picture. The thumb is reaching towards the small finger, and the question is if this is opposition. I tell you no. This other picture shows opposition. So what's the difference here? The difference is if your um, the motor branch to your thenar muscles were not working then this is how you would oppose your thumb. You would keep your um, thumb proximal phalanx flat to the hand and you reach towards the small finger as opposed to reaching over and pointing the thumb here. So there's a big difference between these two pictures. One is opposing, utilizing your opposing muscles of your thumb to get there. And the picture on the uh, left side is not using the thumb opposition muscles. And so it's very important that you distinguish when you're talking to the patient, um, the differences between these two. So have the patient touch their pinky tip is the easiest way to test for opposition and function of the median nerve at the thumb. Oh, sorry. And then the other thing is um, Palmer uh, abduction. Okay, there's two different ways in, in the plane of the thumb as opposed to straight up and these things test uh, different muscle parts. It's important to, to do both. And then there's extension of the fingers and the thumb, and then adduction, adduction of the thumb. And so to test here, this, this uh, tendon here is the extensor pollicis longus in the picture on the left. And it, it allows, as you guys probably remember from anatomy, extensor pollicis longus has the word extensor, pollicis meaning thumb, longus meaning the long tendon. It extends the the tip of the interphalangeal joint of the thumb. The best way to test this is to hold the thumb flat against a table and then have them extend the thumb off the table and you could test it on yourself. Um, that motion is, is true thumb extension and that tests that motion. And then adduction is more simple. You just place the thumb adjacent to the other fingers. So, you can measure extension if you have a goniometer. Um, that's helpful. Interestingly, MP joint motion is very variable. So some people can only flex their MP joint 20 degrees compared to others who can flex it more than 90 degrees. Um, and so it's important to test the other side when you do this. So you can see a big difference between those two pictures, somebody who's hyper flexible at that joint versus somebody who's not. Neither of these patients has any pathology. This is just normal function. This picture basically says the same. Um, <clears throat> different people's ability to flex and extend is highly variable in the thumb. So you look at these folks and you wanna know if their extension is normal. How do you do that? Well, you have to compare it to the other side. So what does this picture show? This picture on the left here shows this person is trying to touch their pinky finger. And you can see that on the right side that 
they're unable to, probably because their abductor muscles of their thumb don't work, like from a bad carpal tunnel syndrome or from a median nerve injury, as opposed to the left, where they're able to do that. And then here again, on this side, you see um, pretty equal motion on both sides. So pinch strength, again, there's different kinds of pinch strength. There's lateral, what we call key pinch strength. There's tips pinch strength and chuck pinch, where you're pinching all three fingers together. Um, and those are all um, important quantitative analyses of pinch strength for the thumb. And then we test individual muscles and muscle groups. <clears throat> you see up here, the flexor pollicis longus tests thumb flexion. The EPL on the top right side we talked about before. The APL is an adjacent muscle that you can test by, by having the finger abduct off the table. The phenar muscles innervated by the median nerve are in the thumb, you have the patient squeeze the pinky finger and you feel that muscle to see that it works. And then the adductor, the adductor pulses, which brings the thumb to the finger and the first dorsal interosseous muscle are tested when you have the patient make an okay sign and squeeze hard and you palpate those muscles there as well. We also look, when we look at patients in hand surgery uh, for muscle atrophy, as you guys know that when a muscle is not innervated for a period of time, you can have um, muscle atrophy. There are certain uh, pathognomonic um, muscle atrophy signs that are key for us. So you see here in this patient, he has, this patient has severe atrophy of the thenar musculature is indicative of a median nerve injury, either at the carpal tunnel or, or, or somewhere higher above in their chain of events. It could be even as high as C7 in the uh, brachial plexus or in the uh, spinal cord. And here again, it is a nice picture of, of two hands where one is normal and one is abnormal. You can see a nice plump thenar musculature here and obviously wasting here, uh, indicative of a median nerve injury. And this patient in the middle here, there is um, severe atrophy of the interosseous muscles um, as well as clawing of the fourth and fifth digits, which is classic for an ulnar nerve injury or a CAT1 pathology as well, or in the brachial plexus, a medial cord injury, all of which affect the same nerve grouping. Um, so motor function, again, uh, radial nerve, you can test the EPL a thumbs up type of maneuver like we, what, like we discussed. The median nerve, we test the FPL and, and Palmer abduction. And the anterior interosseous nerve. Um, this is a little bit more detailed uh, for, for, for some folks, but if you are interested in hand surgery or if you're doing an orthopedic rotation, um, recall that the anterior interosseous nerve is a branch of the median nerve and it, um, it innervates the thumb flexor, the um, flexor pollicis longus, as well as the flexor digitorum profundus to the index finger. Um, and so you have the patient try to do an okay sign. And if they cannot um, flex the uh, FPL and the, the index finger uh, um, DIP joint, then they, they may have a uh, anterior interosseous nerve injury. So this, this, in this hand here, the, the hand on the far uh, right is normal and the hand on the far left is abnormal because that patient is not able to flex when asked to flex the, um, the uh, thumb IP or the index finger um, DIP joint. And then ulnar nerve pinch, you have the patient uh, pinch hard and you palpate to see if they can um, you can palpate these muscles. The other thing you can do for the ulnar nerve is have them adduct and abduct the fingers, spread and spread the fingers out and bring them together to look for interosseous nerve injuries. And then of course, sensation. Um, again, the radial, median and ulnar nerves 
uh, the radial nerve, you want to test dorsal thumb and index web space. So that first web space, the median nerve, you want to test the palmar surface of the index or thumb. And then the ulnar nerve, you want to test the palmar surface of the small finger. We do things called two point discrimination and we do monofilament testing. Um, if you're in the emergency room and you suspect a laceration, the most useful test is to do a two point discrimination and understand that five millimeters, as is demonstrated here, five millimeters is normal. So they should be able to distinguish between one point and two different points at about five millimeters. So if you don't have this fancy little uh, nerve discriminator, two point nerve discriminator, you can take a paper clip and a ruler and get five millimeters between the ends of the paper clip and test them. And you can then document that they have five millimeters of two point discrimination. They can tell that there are two points touching them versus one point. And that gives you a sense of how abnormal their nerve, their um, nerve injury is. The monofilament testing is really more of a special specialized testing um, for um, what we call threshold testing and it's more appropriate for chronic nerve injuries and probably not something you would test in the in the urgent care setting or emergency setting. And then of course we test for capillary refill. Normal is less than two seconds. You guys may have heard of the Allen's test for the wrist, <clears throat> but we also do digital Allen's tests sometimes for patients who have vasculopathies. So the Allen's test, um, again, is where you have the patient um, open their hands, you compress the ulnar nerve and the radial, excuse me, the ulnar artery and the radial artery at the wrist, and you have them open their hand and you document how long it takes for their hands to um, get their capillary refill back. You first test one, one artery and then the other to, to uh, determine patency of those arteries to determine whether or not they have conditions of the hand. There's multiple conditions um, of the hand and wrist that can cause poor circulation. Some of it has to do with um, vasculopathies, vasculitis. There's, um, you can get aneurysms, particularly in the ulnar artery um, that can cause uh, problems. You can get vasospasm, Raynaud's disease, multiple reasons why you can have poor vascularity to the hand. Um, and then and then you can see here that you op have them open the hand and then you remove your hand from the radial artery and you see how long it takes for them to get normal color back. So you see the difference here, the hand is white. And then after you've removed pressure, you see the hand pink up. So you know that the radial ar artery is patent. However, if it takes, you know, two minutes for it to reach that, then obviously you have a problem. And then you do the same thing with the ulnar nerve. And then you see here again. So that's how you do an Allen's test correctly. And here's the same thing for the digits. Sometimes a bit of a struggle when the patient has a lot of pain. A lot of these patients who have vasculopathies to the tip of their hand or their thumb may have a lot of pain here. So not every patient is gonna be so eager for you to squeeze the heck out of their thumb so you can get a good test. But nonetheless, this is sort of how you do it. You would cause compression at the digital arteries of the thumb and then you uh, take your hand away. Immediately afterwards, the, the thumb blanches and you take pressure off one side, it pinks up and you document how long that takes. You do it again on the other side and then the same thing happens. So that's a digital Allen's test. And then joint stability. So every joint, remember we've gone through this now. If you remember, as we've gone through this, we looked, we inspected the hand, we looked for atrophy, um, <clears throat> then we tested muscle strength, we tested general range of motion, we tested the nerve function, uh, we tested the vascularity, and now we're testing stability of the joints. And so for the thumb, a common injury is an ulnar collateral ligament injury or a skier's thumb, and so we test stability of that thumb. Now the first time you'll test stability, if you do it correctly, you'll notice some laxity in the thumb uh, metacarpal phalangeal joint, that's normal to have some laxity. The best way to figure it out, the patient's normal baseline laxity is of course to test the other side <clears throat> and see what, what sort of laxity they have. Um, and so we have a grade of laxity, um, which 
which again is obviously difficult to know unless you've done hundreds of exams, but understand that there's a grade from one to three about how lax a thumb may be and when it becomes pathologic. We also do anterior to posterior stability at the MP joint, gives you a sense of how lax their ligaments are. This is just an example of how you do that. And then um, we look at the CMC joint. So the thumb CMC joint is where you have a lot of arthritis. It's, it's right in this region of the thumb. Okay, there's a, a, a translation test and a grind test to kind of sense how, how much stability you have and how much pain the patient might have. So where that finger is is where that joint is. And then there's a couple of other tests that we, we check for that are very common in pathognomonic for the hand. Unfortunately, we're not doing this live or we could kind of uh, do this in person, um, but uh, there are sort of three signs that we're looking at here. Um, the first one, number one, is hyperextension at the MP joint, and then you have flexion here at the IP joint. So what the examiner is asking this patient to do is to grip this, this piece of paper utilizing their hands, but to try to keep this IP joint flat and to use their adductor muscle to hold the paper in place. And the patient is unable to do that. And what they do is they end up flexing the IP joint of the thumb and hyperextending the MP joint of the thumb to kind of keep that there. And those two signs are, um, this is the Froman sign, Number two is the Froman sign, and number one is called the gene sign. And those are indicative of an ulnar nerve injury. So, you know, even if you don't, if you guys uh, don't end up seeing hand patients, um, this may show up in a board examination. So it's, it's, it's uh, at least helpful to know those signs. And then over here, this patient has pain over the first dorsal compartment of the thumb. They're asked to grip their uh, thumb in their hand and you are radially, excuse me, ulnarly deviating the thumb and they would have pain over the first dorsal compartment, which is a sign of Decrovane's tenosynovitis. And this sign is called the Finkelstein sign or Finkelstein's maneuver, um, epitomized by, by uh, the namesake, Dr. Finkelstein. Uh, and that is a, a pathognomonic uh, indicator of Decrovane's tenosynovitis, okay? So uh, bottom line for the sign, always listen to patients. Um, they will uh, happily recount to you all of their signs. A lot of us are, are very busy. You know, we see in our clinic and my clinic, I'll see anywhere from 40 to 50 patients in a day. Um, but that's, you know, certainly not an excuse to listen to a full history. Um, know your anatomy. Uh, it'll serve you well throughout your career. The more anatomy you know, the better doctor you'll be. If you decide to go into a surgical field, um, absolutely the key to your success is, to your success is knowing your anatomy. Um, make your exams more than more than just descriptive. They need to be quantitative so you can go back and compare. Um, and again, it's called the practice of medicine for a reason. The more patients you see, the more things you observe, the more people you get involved in. Uh, makes you a better doctor. Um, so uh, that's the end of that specific portion of the lecture. I want to pull up for you guys one more quick uh, little lecture and we can continue. Okay, um, can you guys see my screen? Yes, doctor. Okay. So, um, oh, sorry, let me go back. So I do hand to shoulder surgery um, and I've done a lot of trauma in my training. And so a lot of my surgeries look kind of like this where I have done total elbows or, or, or elbow reconstructions. 
Um, but that's not what I want to talk to you guys about today. I wanted to just talk about a few other things that we do that are a little bit out of the box that we've seen great results with that are a little bit different. So this is not going to take long. Just want to kind of go through a few things with you. So one of them that has really changed my practice is something called a cell. Um, you know, like many of you, I'm sure, um, out there, we get, you get, uh, you'll see maybe some, from some of your attendings, products coming to you from different manufacturers. And, and a lot of it, in my opinion, is frankly, hocus pocus. Um, and it's driven by sales and marketing rather than science. But I will tell you that this particular product, Acel, has uh, really made a difference in my practice and I, and I use it a fair amount. It's actually made from the porcine bladder, the pig bladders, essentially. And it's, um, it's uh, this matrix of pig bladder. Pig bladder is highly regenerative, meaning that if you cut it, it will regenerate. And so there's this product that we utilize to grow um, finger tissue. So this is, a, this is a typical case. So this gentleman had an amputation of the tip of his thumb. You can see here from the side that most of the dorsal aspect is gone all the way down to the nail. And a large portion of the volar aspect of the thumb is also gone. And in my, in my old practice, or in, in days past before I used to use a cell, we would debride this. We would, he would either get a completion amputation because there's bone exposed, or I would take a skin graft uh, from a different portion of his thumb and cover up that wound, understanding that he would probably never have a nail again because the skin graft from another part of his hand would not allow you know, a thumb to grow. However, since utilizing a cell, what you do is you put a graft and some skin tissue there. Um, and you'll see this powder type stuff that you put into the wound. And over the course of about two, uh, a month to two, he starts to regenerate his thumb. And so that you see um, <clears throat> after a period of time, he actually grows. Now look, this isn't as long as a normal thumb, but for all intents and purposes, he has a functional stable thumb um, without a lot of reconstructive surgery. So again, um, this stuff is, is, uh, is helpful and useful in, in clinical practice. Another thing, um, finger fractures. So I'm sure this is a very, very common injury. You see it all the time. It's been um, treated successfully for many, many years. Um, the typical way of treating this is with a plate and screws or K wires. The problem with plates and screws is that wires can be proud. They can be irritative. They need to be taken out. So the patient needs a second surgery. Often when there's a wire in place, um, patients are, are not in, uh, able to move because they feel like they have pain. And so the patients become stiff. Uh, this other example with a plate and screws, the fracture looks perfectly good. The, whoever did the surgery did an excellent job of putting the fracture back in place. The problem is that that plate is, is, is rigid and proud and it causes irritation with the tendons. In order to put this plate in place, you have to make a fairly large incision, which causes scar tissue. Um, if any of you have ever been involved in caring for these patients, it takes a, a fair amount of therapy and rehab to, to get them, you know, back to, back to where they can use their hand normally again. Um, and so we, I've been using, utilizing very successfully um, a different method. So this is a case. This patient has a um, fracture of the metacarpal neck and, and, and shaft displaced. And what we do is we put in a, a, a intramedullary screw. So this can be done with a pretty minimally invasive technique. The nice thing is that this patient doesn't need a cast. They don't need um, immobilization. They don't need a second surgery and they can start moving right away. Uh, a lot of people who end up with this injury tend to be um, men who are, uh, let's say, not the best patients. I can say that because I'm a I'm a man, I'm probably not the best patient, but the average 20 something year old male who's punched a wall. Um, and so, you know, they tend not to follow up well, they tend not to attend therapy. They tend not to um, be diligent with your advice to the same degree as maybe some other folks. And so this is the perfect operation for these folks because this operation doesn't need as much care. Once the screw is in and it's quite solid, the patient can start moving. And, and so I'm finding I'm almost having to beg some of these patients to come back for a final follow-up because they feel so good. And frankly, they don't, they don't want to come in. Um, <clears throat> here's another case of a phalanx fracture. And again, utilizing screws and a minimal amount of fixation to put the fracture where it should go to where that you can have the patient start to move right away. 
So there's less scar tissue. You can start motion right away. Often, I don't recommend therapy for these patients because they can move uh, around quickly. If you're in a situation where you're um, where therapy is not so easily available, this is a great um, option for these folks because there's an, and also there's no need to remove the hardware afterwards and no cast. As you know, your patients probably hate casts as much as mine do. And so if you can avoid a cast, um, you know, it's ideal. Okay. Other thing that we use a fair amount are biologic agents, uh, one of which has gotten quite a bit of uh, attention uh, is uh, PRP or platelet-rich plasma, which basically has growth factors. Now, PRP has been touted as having many, many magical qualities. Um, however, at least in my clinical practice, I use it in a fairly limited amount, but successfully. Um, the other thing is amniotic fluid, which is placenta derived, which has supposedly even more growth factors. The jury is out, however, if all of those growth factors are biologically available or not. But both of them are studies to, there's studies to support both of them. I, I use both um, limitedly. Um, PRP, I found great success with lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow that hasn't gotten better um, or other tendinopathies. Um, rotator cuff tears that are only partial and don't need surgery do very well with, with PRP. Um, so uh, that's also been a, a, change, a, a game changer. The other thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is something called BMAC or bone marrow aspirate concentrate, which is true stem cells. <clears throat> we derive these, we usually harvest these from the um, su anterior superior iliac spine or the posterior superior iliac spine in the pelvis. And there are many, many growth factors um, that you concentrate. So you take about 60 cc's of this bone marrow aspirate and you, you spin it down to three or four cc's. So you can imagine the level of concentrate of these stem cells and then you can utilize them multiple ways. I wanted to, um, I'm, I'll share with you guys a little bit later a case that I, I use them for. So PRP I use for tennis elbow and golfer's elbow access successfully, cuff tears. You can see here what it looks like injecting into a shoulder. Uh, there's multiple studies that show that it's, it's, it's quite beneficial. This is a study from New Orleans, Tulane University. Dr. Savoy is a, is a leader in the field of orthopedics and he shows a study that it's um, his, in his hands, just as good as surgery for um, medial epicondylitis, better known as golfer's elbow. So the bone marrow aspirate concentrate has uh, really good results for me with fracture non-union. So fractures that are not healing properly in their normal course. And I've been able to successfully um, uh, have patients avoid a surgery by utilizing this. So what you do is you harvest the bone marrow um, <clears throat> from the pelvis. The pelvis has the best concentration of these cells. You concentrate it in a centrifuge and then you apply it to the injury. It's about a 15 to 20 minute process of spinning these cells. So here's a case. This patient was actually an American ninja warrior who, who broke his um, scaphoid bone. So you can see this fracture here. So in, in many people, for me, this would be a cast. This would not necessarily be surgery. The fracture is slightly displaced, um, but often these can heal with a cast, but it's a cast for 12 weeks. And this patient who um, is a high level athlete and has multiple competitions and things like that was wanted to keep training while he had this injury meaning that he wanted to do cardio and he didn't want to be sweaty in a cast. And so he wanted to heal as, as best as possible. So he decided to do surgery. So we put a screw in, the fracture, the surgery went fine and he put a screw in. Unbeknownst to me, however, he had ulterior motive of wanting to do these American Ninja uh, Warrior contests a few days, in fact, a few weeks after surgery. He's, we followed him on social media and he was posted he had posted himself doing some contests afterwards, which were against my advice. And lo and behold, he started to have widening of its fracture site. There's loosening around his screw here. So not a good situation. And I gave him the option of either starting from scratch, meaning we would take the screw out and um, 
start over all over again. And then I would put him in a cast for 12 weeks and hope for the best. Or he had the option of using this bone marrow aspirin. Now bone marrow aspirin is not covered by insurance, but this gentleman had a sponsorship and, and he was able to come up with the money to, to undergo this. So that's what we did. We injected him with the bone marrow aspirin and put him in a cast for a few weeks. And, you know, obviously I'm looking at this agonizing, but we did this and, and, and he healed, his fracture healed. Great, without having to do a new surgery. Um, and so that was lucky for him. Here's another case of a gentleman who was seen in the Dominican Republic. He had a severe injury of his hand. He had these wires and rods put into his hand to try to salvage this. Um, but you can see that they're not fully healed. This is like 10 months after his surgery. And so again, we offered him bone marrow aspirate and a cast. And then you can see here that after, this is probably about eight weeks after we did the bone marrow aspirate that he is, oops, sorry, he has uh, healed all these spots here. And so that allowed him to avoid having to go through a major surgery with plates and screws. So everybody, thank you. That's all I have. Um, I would love to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Cardoso. What a great presentation. I always enjoy listening to this uh, incredible level of detail, especially on the surgical side. As we wait uh, for questions, I wanted to ask you how long before you determine that a patient is a candidate for the ACL? Let's assume for a moment that the patient had an injury and now he heard of this procedure, this treatment, and wants to come to see if he can regenerate that part of the thumb. Uh, how long is a, an appropriate time for the patient to wait before you decide to treat him? It, it should be relatively acute. I mean, within a month, most likely, unless, unless we want to try to grow new tissue and we'd have to sort of re amputate the part or, or what, what's, what's key to, to the success of the A cell is it actually latches onto the parts of the body that grow again. So in order for it to like grow that thumb like that, you needed some portion of the nail bed to, as you know, nails grow. And so nail beds grow. And so it needs to have some portion of that nail bed to be exposed um, in order to, for it to kind of generate again. So it could be for any, any digit in the body, we even use it on open wounds elsewhere, but it has to be a, a wound that hasn't fully sealed off. And before necrotic tissue comes to play well, as well. well. Well, we can always remove necrotic tissue, believe it. So we can cut out the necrotic tissue, and as long as we can get to healthy tissue, then we can, we can use the product. Fantastic. Uh, there is another question here. It says, um, I would like to ask a good doctor if uh, after having tendon repair on the thumb, there are now scar tissue formed. In physical therapy, it's not necessarily working. Is there an alternative treatment to having another procedure at the hospital to normalize the function of the thumb? Possibly, depending on which tendon it is um, and why they're having scarring. Um, we, for whatever reason, end up having to do what we call tenolysis or we, we, we release adhesions um, frequently. Um, lately, the way many of us in the hand surgery world are doing this is called wide awake surgery. So what I mean by that is we will numb up the patient with uh, lidocaine with epinephrine right before the surgery. And then we have the surgery, we do the surgery while the patient is awake. The reason we do that is because we have the patient in real time trying to, if it's trying to get function, whatever that function is. So for example, if the patient had a thumb flexor tendon done and they can't get flexion, we would have the patient try to flex during the surgery until we can achieve that. So we leave the operating room knowing that what we did actually works so that we call that wide awake surgery. So yeah, certainly there's a possibility. It depends on what the conditions around that problem are. Um, we, we've been seeing a lot of um, hand referrals, uh, if I may call them that way. And typically, are because of pain secondary to arthritis or someone uh, has diagnosed the patient with trigger finger or Dupuytren's disease or ganglion cyst. Would these type of conditions be necessarily the most 
frequently used, I mean, seen in, in your practice? Is that something that uh, other physicians, let's say in Latin America can relate to? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I would say my top few diagnoses are trigger finger, ganglion cysts, arthritis, carpal tunnel syndrome, and dip curving. So, so those, are, those are frequently seen throughout the world. Um, very, very common. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, there is a question from uh, Anna Miller. Uh, what is your experience with neuropathic pain after having lesion and surgery? What is your algorithm of management? Okay. Um, I need a little bit more detail from you uh, about what sort of neuropathic pain we're talking about. Um, is it related to an amputation? Is it a, related to a nerve injury specifically that happened during surgery? Is it generalized like complex regional pain syndrome after surgery? So a little bit more detail and I can answer that question better for you. As we wait for her doctor, um, how can we actually decipher or distinguish in the referral process when a patient comes with numbness, let's say, of a portion of the hand, uh, but uh, also is complaining of cervical pain. Um, typically, cervical pain or, or, or that kind of um, uh, referred pain is typically sent to a neurologist and, or an orthopedic, but uh, they don't necessarily um, know at the moment. How can we actually discern this is more for hand surgeon? And if such is the case, would you be able to actually help or correct the compression for those type of nerves? So um, I see that all the time. Uh, a lot of what I see when I see a patient with numbness in my brain, I'm already trying to decide, is this coming from the cervical spine or if this is coming from the arm? Because there's a lot of crossover. I use a, a, a few clues to try to clue me in on, on which one. Besides, of course, the physical examination, uh, one of the important clues in the history is if the, if the numbness is constant or if it's intermittent. And so people with cervical pain, they tend to have the numbness constantly and it's in a very specific region. So they'll tell me, you know, the tip of my index finger is numb all the time. From the time I wake up to the time I sleep, it's constantly numb. Or I have numbness in my arm, but it's all the time. Um, the, another thing with cervical pain, interestingly, is that they may have um, sort of irrational itchiness. So the irritation of the nerve can also cause itchiness. So you could have like sort of a pruritic region in part of your arm and that, that goes along with that. As opposed to, for example, carpal tunnel. So uh, the typical carpal tunnel patient will tell me, you know, most of the time I'm fine except when I'm driving or fixing my hair or when I go to sleep and then all of a sudden my hand falls asleep. That's much more likely to be carpal tunnel than it is to be cervical spine related. Right. And um, I, I suppose that with this new environment of the Zoom, you're going to be getting a lot of the carpal tunnel patients as well. Mm -hmm. So Brenda, Dr. Brenda Salazar, I think it is a student doctor, and uh, she is saying it's regional pain syndrome. So complex regional pain syndrome is um, very, very challenging to treat. Um, there's two kinds. There's C, uh, complex regional pain syndrome one versus two. It has to do with um, how specific it's related to a specific nerve root. Um, but that is a challenge that we still have difficulty treating. You know, the, the mainstay of treatment still involves therapy. There are also things like stellate ganglion blocks. Um, the main thing with complex regional pain syndrome is that it doesn't respond very well to, to surgery. There's some some more advanced treatments. Some people in Germany, actually even in the United States, are inducing, in patients who have severe, severe complex regional pain syndrome, they're inducing ketamine comas to these patients and they're in the ICU for three days. Obviously there's tremendous risk with that, putting a patient intubated in the ICU under a ketamine drip in a coma, but some of these patients have such desperate pain that they'll do anything um, I think there are a few patients in the United States, doctors in the United States who are doing that sort of treatment, but most patients, luckily, um, can improve with some combination of therapy and stellate ganglion blocks um, for that particular problem. But that's a very, very tough problem. It is indeed. Um, we have a question from one of our 
and country managers uh, from Honduras. And uh, she is asking, would uh, PRP plasma therapy be used in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and for swollen or deformed fingers? Would it ease the pain and facilitate movement? A great question. Um, it has been used for that. And so I know many rheumatologists who, who recommend PRP uh, for joints. It certainly doesn't slow deformity. Um, it certainly doesn't slow deformity of the joints. It may provide some, um, some anti-inflammatory properties and may give the patient some temporary relief. Um, when it comes to arthritis in general, uh, there has been some pretty decent studies on osteoarthritis and BMAC, so the bone marrow aspirate concentrate. A uh, fair number of people, um, both in the U.S. and, and overseas, there's um, a couple of thought leaders in Australia, for example, who have um, demonstrated through studies that the bone marrow aspirate in osteoarthritic joints has been shown to slow down arthritis. Um, PRP is probably beneficial more on a temporary, temporizing level. Um, and certainly in rheumatoid arthritis where the, where the underlying cause is inflammatory, it's probably not as helpful as for osteoarthritis. Got it. Dr. Rivas. Thank you, Dr. Hakeem. Uh, I just got a compliance uh, warning from IT in the middle of this uh, situation and my screen went yellow. Um, Doctor, I, I think he just uh, answered the uh, Ana Catalina Salas' question from Costa Rica of uh, arthritis. But uh, on TV, there's not a day that you don't turn on the TV and somebody's trying to sell you something. You know, it's collagen this, collagen that. And so I'd like your, your, your opinion on, you know, again, benefits versus, you know, the possibilities of what, what, what could happen if you take too much of it. Yeah, what do you recommend to your patients uh, in, in your practice? For arthritis specifically? Yeah. So I, I see a lot of patients who come in for the first time with, with arthritis, especially at the base of the thumb. Um, there's, like you said, there's so many things out there that, frankly, one, one of the things that, you know, they talk about collagen and glucosamine conjugate and sulfate. I have yet to see a scientific study that shows that they help. And I have also yet to see a patient who actually comes to me and say, you know, I started taking glucosamine and my joint pain is better. I've never seen that patient. Um, and so what I recommend uh, is a couple of things. So one of the things that I have seen a benefit from is actually um, high, high concentrations of turmeric pills. Um, so a thousand milligrams of turmeric daily um, has been shown to have a benefit. I actually had a patient who I had signed up for surgery um, and she started taking the turmeric and she said, you know what, the thumb's not bothering me enough anymore. So, so she took turmeric, um, you know, topical things like capsaicin, Voltaire and gel can help to alleviate symptoms. Heat is great. And so in some of my um, older uh, patients, I'll have them put their hands in paraffin wax baths to alleviate cold. You know, there's a reason why people retire in Florida is because of the warm weather helps with joints as opposed to the cold. And so keeping the joints warm, that can be uh, calming. And then taking antioxidants. And so if, if you find something early enough to prevent arthritis, taking vitamin E and, and eating foods high in antioxidants. So those are kind of the supplemental stuff that we recommend. Great. Thank, uh, you, Dr. We have a of, we, thank you, Dr. Rivas. We have a couple of questions. Uh, one from another student, Dr. Kimani. I'm wondering what university he's from, but uh, he's saying, um, can you share with us what drugs you have available in the use of emergency for reversal of a epinephrine uh, for wide awake surgery? So we've we've never we've never had that um, that issue of 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 reversal um, necessity for reversal. I'm curious if if the doctor has had that that um, that problem in his practice. And so, you know, if you use the lidocaine with, with epi for wide awake, um, we've never really need to use an antidote for that. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear his follow-up to, to whether he's had a problem with that. Dr. Kiwani, Kimani is uh, from um, Trinidad and he's an orthopedic surgeon. 
Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your question. If you would like, uh, we can do a follow-up question later on as well. Um, we have a comment back for you, and it says, uh, and it's from Anna Basile, one of our in-country managers as well. Uh, my rheumatologist ordered three glucosamine uh, chondroitin, uh, three turmeric curcumin, and two in a root per day, and my arthritis pain is gone. <laughs> Ginger root is mm -hmm. the way to go, so there you go. Okay, good to know. <laughs> yeah. By the way, she prescribed it to me too, uh, doctor. Okay, good. She tries to make, she's, uh, she's our work mother. Gotcha. Great. Uh, so uh, Dr. Kamani uh, responded uh, actually from Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex and uh, says, I haven't had a problem, but just wanted to know as a backup. Great question. Question. Great question. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, we have reached the top of the hour and uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Cardoso, for this incredible presentation uh, in your time. And on behalf of Baptist Health International, I would like to thank you all for participating uh, today in this incredibly and informative presentation. If you have additional questions to Dr. Cardoso, please send them to us at the International Baptist Health at NET. We look forward to seeing you at our next monthly medical lecture which is scheduled for Wednesday, November 11th, 2020. Thank you again. Have a great afternoon and be safe. Thank you, Dr. Cardoso. Great.